This video discussion in the clinical toxicology series is all about envenomation. Envenomation is a kind of poisoning. Poisoning is where something toxic gets into your body, regardless of the mechanism of entry, but the distinguishing factor with envenomation is that there is some other animal that has produced the poison that gets into your body, typically through a bite or sting. This discussion is based on some of my previously existing content that's now being redeployed for the Clinical Toxicology course. And the content covers several chapters in Goldfrank's Toxicologic Emergencies, mostly those about arthropods, marine envenomations, and native, United States, venomous snakes and lizards, although there will be some reference also to the antidotes and depth chapters for their respective antivenoms. The learning objectives for this session are that you'll be able to describe the three flavors of toxicity seen with rattlesnake envenomation, recognize which envenomations in the U.S. have commercially available antivenom, and explain the epidemiologic basis why your patient's skin lesion is not a brown recluse spider bite. And here's an outline of what I'm going to be talking about in this video. I'm going to be talking about snakes, and most of that time is going to be talking about pit vipers, which includes the rattlesnakes as well as cottonmouths, a little bit about coral snakes and other elapids. Then we're going to hit spiders, and I'm going to be mentioning the widow spiders and recluse spiders, and then at the end, covering scorpion envenomation. So raise your hand if you want to hear about snakes first, like this patient right here, who is a patient that I was consulted on who'd been bitten by a sidewinder rattlesnake, and we were taking care of him in the medical intensive care unit at UCI. There's a couple of interesting findings here. He was bitten on the middle finger, and you can see that that one appears to be a little bit more affected than the others, and there's actually a hemorrhagic bulla, which is a blister with blood in it on his finger. And then we also see some more proximal findings. There's a lot of bruising on his arm. And then interestingly, this guy also had a tattoo on his arm of a tarantula. Rattlesnakes account for most of the species, as well as most of the venomous snake bites that occur in North America. There's actually six species of rattlesnakes that are found in California, three of which are found in Orange County. The warning sign over on the right-hand side is from a photo I took when I went to do some hiking at the Holy Jim Trail in Tribuco Canyon. In the American Southeast, we also find the cottonmouths, which are sometimes called water moccasins, as well as the copperhead snakes. We're going to be focusing more on rattlesnakes since those are the venomous snakes found in this area. Rattlesnakes are pit vipers, and they're not called pit vipers because they live in pits. They're called pit vipers because they are vipers that have this heat-sensing pit organ, which is located between their nostril and their eye. So it detects heat, and they can use this to detect and range warm-blooded prey, typically small rodents like mice or rats. And then we also see here the characteristic shape of the pupil that rattlesnakes have. They have lens-shaped pupils like we see in cats. However, often in the literature, these are mentioned as elliptical, but they're not rounded like ellipses are. They are shaped like lenses. And those are just some of the features which can help us differentiate between venomous and non-venomous snakes. If we look over to the left, we see some of the features seen in venomous snakes. They tend to have this kind of triangular, blocky-shaped head. They will have this so-called elliptical pupil, which is really a lens-shaped pupil, as well as this additional organ, the heat-sensing pit, between their eye and their nostril. And if you were able to get close enough to one and turn it over and take a look at its subcaudal plates, you'll see that there's only a single row. And this would distinguish them from a lot of non-venomous snakes that have a more rounded, actually a lip-shaped head. They'll have a round pupil, and they will have a double row of subcaudal plates. With regards to snake bite, there is this concept in the literature called legitimacy of the snake bite, which is really asking if it truly was an accident or if the human that was involved was doing something they probably shouldn't have. So a legitimate bite would be where the human-snake interaction was completely unintentional. In fact, the human may not have known the snake was even there until it bit them. These legitimate bites tend to occur more on the lower extremities because the snakes are down on the ground and we're walking by, perhaps getting too close, and the snake will strike what is closest to them. However, the illegitimate bites are where the human exposure to the snake was intentional. The person was doing something with the snake, and because the way we interact with things is typically with our hands and looking at it with our faces, 
these illegitimate bites tend to occur more commonly on the upper extremities or sometimes the face. And this leads into the next issue of who is it among humans who gets bitten the most? This tends to be a lot of intoxicated young men who are teasing or playing with the snake or picking it up or even kissing it or perhaps even putting its head in their mouth. Some really ill-advised things and lo and behold, they suffer for it. This brings up the question, what is the best first aid device for rattlesnake bites? Well, it turns out that the answer is cell phones and car keys, because there's really not all that much you can do before you arrive for more definitive medical care. There's a lot of stories and myths about what you can do. Some people have recommended cutting right around the area that you were bitten and trying to suck the venom out. Of course, unless you know what you're doing, you might damage some underlying structures. It's not really all that effective. And all of those snake bite kits that you can buy at sporting goods stores, they're really virtually useless. The amount of suction that you can get is just not enough. There are other things that have been recommended in the past, like applying a tourniquet to cut off the blood flow so that it won't spread to the rest of the body. Well, a tourniquet's not a good idea unless you're bleeding to death. It's also been recommended to decrease the amount of pain and swelling to either apply ice or to immerse the affected extremity into ice water or even to use electrical shock. This last one actually has a theory behind it. The idea is that the venom is comprised of various proteins, and if you denature the proteins, then there'll be less venom effect. The problem is that any kind of electrical shock you can apply will denature other proteins, like the proteins in your body. So then what things, if anything, are a good idea? Well, you should remove constricting clothing and jewelry. It is quite likely that the affected extremity is going to start to get swollen, and you don't want a ring or a bracelet causing some kind of constrictive injury. If you can, it would be ideal to place the victim at rest. However, if the bite occurred out in the wilderness, you first need to get the person to some medical care, so there's a limitation into how much rest you can actually achieve. It may help to elevate the affected extremity because that will decrease the amount of swelling since you're using gravity to your benefit. And the traditional treatment of giving liquor and more liquor is probably going to be ineffective. Now, there is another method of first aid that has been favored in the Australian literature called pressure immobilization. This is a combination of using an ace wrap and a splint. So the idea is that you have some light compression with the ace wrap that blocks lymphatic flow. The venom is believed to be absorbed primarily through the lymphatics, but you don't apply enough pressure that you're actually causing any kind of tourniquet effect. And in addition to the ace wrap, you apply some kind of splint, which just helps to immobilize the area. Hence, you have pressure and immobilization, pressure immobilization. Now, one other thing people get wrong is they think that they need to bring the snake to the hospital. It is not necessary to bring the snake to the hospital. For one thing, the snake can still bite you, even if you have killed the snake, even if you've beheaded the snake or bludgeoned it until you saw that it was motionless. In fact, dead rattlesnakes can reflexively bite for about an hour, so you really need to leave them alone. In addition, you don't need to bring in the snake because the antivenoms that are available are effective against all North American pit viper species. So as long as we know that it's a venomous snake, the antivenom that we have available will work. Now, the most amusing thing about this picture is we see that the physician who's actually taking care of the patient is almost off camera here to the right side of the slide. This was a very tall resident I was working with, whereas the shortest resident we had at the time was the one who picked up the snake that the family had brought along with the patient because that makes the snake look a lot bigger and badder and more dangerous. Rattlesnake venom has three different kinds or three different flavors of toxic effects. One is that it causes local tissue injury. There's progressive pain and swelling that develops, and it kind of works its way up the affected extremity. So somebody bitten on the finger, maybe half an hour later, their finger and their hand is swollen. Fifteen minutes later, the swelling has progressed up above their wrist. And then maybe an hour or two later, it's gone all the way up towards the elbow and so on. Another thing that happens are a number of hematologic effects. There's different components of the venom that can decrease the platelet count, decrease the fibrinogen, increase the prothrombin time slash INR, and all of those together looks like DIC, disseminated intravascular coagulation, when in fact it's not. 
But that's mostly an academic point. All of these changes increase your risk for bleeding. And then there are also some potential neurologic effects, but these tend to be a minor issue with most rattlesnake venom. The kind of neurologic effects you can see are paresthesia, some numbness and tingling. Maybe people will complain of a metallic taste in their mouth, or they will develop some myokymia, some uncontrollable muscle twitching. All right, so what do we do to evaluate a rattlesnake bite? Well, we start off with some stabilization and supportive care. Is their airway okay? I mentioned before that you can sometimes have some people interacting with snakes in ways that they shouldn't. They might have been bitten on the face or on the tongue, and if you start getting some swelling there, the airway can become a serious issue. We're going to want to get IV access. Not only will this allow us to give some IV fluids, but we're also going to need to draw some labs. And then we're going to have to monitor the patient with sets of serial vital signs. We'll want them on a pulse oximeter and cardiac monitor. And this way we'll detect any worsening of clinical status. And should we give the patient some antivenom, there is the possibility of an allergic reaction and we'd want to have this kind of monitoring going on anyway. In our baseline assessment, we want to determine, is there pain and swelling and is it progressive? So we're going to want to document how far up the extremity the swelling is and also measure some baseline limb circumference levels and then measure them serially to see if it's getting bigger. We're going to send blood to get a complete blood count, a PTINR and a fibrinogen level. We're looking to see, do they have low platelet count, thrombocytopenia? Are they coagulopathic? Do they have hypofibrinogenemia? And if any of the above findings are positive, that can be an indication to give the antivenom. Now, it may be possible that the patient doesn't have any initial indication for antivenom. They might have a little bit of pain, but only a trivial amount of swelling, and their initial labs are normal. So we're going to perform serial measurements of limb circumference at several areas on the affected limb, and we're going to mark where they are so that we have some consistency. And then we're going to get some follow-up labs. It just might have taken a few hours for anything to have developed. And if the patient doesn't develop any significant signs or symptoms within four to six hours, we call that a dry bite, which is estimated to occur in up to 25% of rattlesnake bites. So basically anything other than mild pain or minimal swelling or trivial lab abnormalities is going to be an indication to give antivenom. The most commonly used commercially available product is Crofab, Crotalide Polyvalent Immune Fab of ovine origin. This was approved by the FDA in 2000. And there's a newer one that's available called Anavip, Crotalide Immune Fab 2 of equine origin. This was approved by the FDA in 2018, initially only for rattlesnake bites, but then it had its indications extended in 2021 to all of the North American pit vipers. So what is Crofab and how would we make it? The drug company has sheep and these sheep are injected with small amounts of the snake venom. Not enough to make them sick, but certainly it's enough that they can start to mount an immune response against it and they will become hyperimmune. And then periodically their blood is harvested and the serum is purified so that we can concentrate the immunoglobulin. The whole IgG is treated with papain, which is an enzyme derived from papayas, which cleaves the whole IgG so that the fab fragments come off. The fab fragments are the portion that has the specificity just to bind to the venom components, and the FC portion of the immunoglobulin, which is the most immunogenic part, is removed so that it's less likely when you give the fab fragments that it's going to induce an allergic response in the patient. So that was the brief review about pit vipers. There are some other kinds of snakes from another family, the Elapidae. So in the United States, these are the coral snakes. They have a much more limited geographic range. And in fact, the bites from these snakes are much more rare than they are from rattlesnakes and other pit vipers. The kind of toxicity that they cause is instead a neuromuscular weakness and paralysis instead of a progressive local cytotoxicity. Now, you may have heard the cute little rhyme, red on yellow, kill a fellow, red on black, venom lack, because the coral snakes, when you see their colored bands, the red will touch the yellow, whereas there are some other species like king snakes that kind of mimic the venomous kind, but instead the red touches the black and it doesn't touch the yellow. Now, there is an anti-venom that exists for coral snakes in the United States. 
However, it's infrequently used, and in fact, production has ceased. And whenever we get to a date on the label where the antivenom is set to expire, they will retest the antivenom to make sure that it still has potency so that it can be relabeled again and its shelf life extended. In other parts of the world, there are other elapid snakes like the mambas and cobras that can be very dangerous. And they also have some neuromuscular effects that are quite prominent. And if you get envenomated by one of these snakes, it's kind of like developing injectable botulism. So in the top photo shown here, we see a patient who was bitten by one of these elapid snakes. They can barely hold their eyes open. They have eyelid ptosis. And in fact, shortly thereafter, the patient had to be endotracheally intubated because his weakness got so bad. In addition to the neuromuscular effects, they can also have progressive local cytotoxicity as well. So what would you do for a snake bite if you were out hiking or camping? Advanced care is pretty impossible in an austere kind of a setting. You can't get any labs. You're probably not going to have antivenom with you. You're not going to have any of the monitoring equipment. So if somebody gets bitten by a snake, either it has to be trivial and it's bearable to the person, or it is kind of a trip-ending event. Any kind of first aid that you can do, such as a pressure immobilization bandage, is only a bridge until you can get that person to definitive care. And don't do anything invasive, dangerous, or stupid. And speaking of something stupid, I wanted to tell you a little bit more about this example from Annals of Emergency Medicine 1991. This is a case of a young man who was bitten by a snake. He and his friends had the great idea, why don't we denature the proteins in the venom with an electric shock? So they applied an electric shock from a car battery to this guy. It made him pass out. Then they brought him to the hospital. One of the cool things about this article is that it won the authors the Ig Nobel Prize. Not sure if you know about the Ig Nobel Prize, not the Nobel Prize. The Ig Nobel Prize, they honor research that makes people laugh and then makes them think. They basically go and try to find the craziest stuff that gets published. I happen to know Dr. Dart, the lead author here, he is very, very proud of having won the Ig Nobel Prize. All right, we're going to switch from snakes now to spiders. In the United States, there are two medically significant genera of spiders that can cause envenomation. There's the Latrodectus spiders, or the widow spiders, and the Loxosceles species, the recluse spiders. There are several dozen Latrodectus species, or widow spiders, worldwide, and being envenomated by one versus the other causes nearly identical envenomation effects. Within the United States, there are five species. Three of them are actually called the Black Widow, Latrodectus mactans, Variolus, and Latrodectus hesperus, which is the one that we find here in the western United States. There is a small area, mostly in southern Florida, where the Red Widow, or Latrodectus bishopi, can be found. And the most recent widow spider to be found in the United States is the brown widow spider, Latrodectus geometricus. Black widow spiders are synanthropic, which means they like to live in close association with humans, not right next to us, but kind of near us. So they might want to hang out in our garages or woodsheds or wood piles or on lawn furniture, areas that are disturbed by people, but only occasionally visited. And the widow spiders make these irregular webs, usually in dark corners, and they hang upside down from them. They don't make the nice geometrically shaped webs like you might see in cartoons or on Halloween displays. And here's a picture of a black widow hanging upside down from this irregular web. And that globular thing is an egg sac, which probably contains several dozen eggs. The venom in widow spiders contains a toxin called latrotoxin for latrodectus. In the upper right, you see what its structure is, and if you get a tetramer of these together, it will actually form a pore, and it forms a pore in a membrane allowing uncontrolled release of presynaptic neurotransmitters, which includes the release of acetylcholine, resulting in painful muscular contraction, as well as release of norepinephrine, resulting in some sympathomimetic effects. The whole clinical syndrome associated with widow spider bites is called latrodectism. Initially, someone who gets bitten will describe it as feeling pretty similar to a bee sting. And you can often see a dime-sized target lesion in the area where you were bitten. 
Right in the center, there will be central pallor because the uncontrolled release of norepinephrine causes a lot of local vasoconstriction, but then surrounding that is a rim of erythema because the area is becoming inflamed. Pain is the characteristic thing that occurs from a widow spider bite. It can start off localized and then start to spread, moving more proximally. It might move up the arm towards the shoulder and chest or up the leg towards the abdomen or back, and the amount of pain and uncontrolled muscular contraction can mimic that the patient might have an acute abdomen. You might think that they have appendicitis or acute cholecystitis, or if the pain is more in the chest, that their pain seems like the pain of a heart attack. The pain might start out local. You might have localized sweating in the area. You may develop muscle fasciculations and cramping, and it can start to spread proximally from an affected extremity, and these effects can start to spread and just become systemic. There are several other features, including headache, nausea, vomiting, dizziness. You can get an increased heart rate and hypertension from the uncontrolled release of norepinephrine, and there's even reported a characteristic look to the face with sweating and periorbital edema, as shown here. The clinical course typically waxes and wanes, gets better and gets worse, and then it gets better and it gets worse, and it will gradually resolve, typically over several days, if left untreated. How you have to treat it depends upon its severity. It's typically bad enough that the person will need some opiate analgesics. Now, because the normal course is that it waxes and it wanes, you think, I gave some pain medicine, now the patient is better, you send them home. Well, you can expect that it might come back in waves, so they probably need to be discharged home with some additional pain meds. Now, in the U.S., there is an antivenom for black widow spider envenomation. It's pretty infrequently used in the United States. It's actually a lot more commonly used in Australia, and this is mostly due to different concerns for the safety profile. Very, very few people die of black widow spider envenomation, so therefore the treatment could arguably just be symptomatic. And in addition, the most recently reported death related to black widow spider envenomation in the United States, which was in the early 1980s, was actually due to anaphylaxis to the antivenom, thus leading to an increased concern for side effects of the antivenom in the U.S. as compared to Australia. That being said, a study in the U.S. of 163 patients found that using antivenom reduced the admission rate from about one in every two patients to one in every eight. The currently available antivenom is a whole IgG product. There have been studies over about the last two decades of fab fragment antivenoms against widow spiders, which may become more widely available. Now, I mentioned earlier that the latest widow spider species to come on the scene in the United States is Latrodectus geometricus. In fact, this species, called the brown widow spider here and the button spider in some other countries, is the most widely distributed species in the world because it has this habit of hitching rides on cargo from place to place around the world. It was fairly recently introduced into Southern California around the year 2000 and had previously been found in Hawaii, and is also spreading along the coast of the Gulf of Mexico. I showed you before a black widow spider and its smooth round egg sac. The brown widow spider has these spiky egg sacs, and I showed this map of California showing the distribution of the brown widow spider as of 2011. And you'll notice this includes all of Orange County. Next, I'm going to show you some pictures and tell you a story about a patient I saw who had a brown widow spider bite. This is the posterior thigh of a 14-year-old girl who was out talking to her friend sitting on some lawn furniture. She felt a sharp prick or a bite to the posterior thigh. This occurred about 30 minutes before she came to the emergency department, and I took this picture. She was able to snap a photo of some egg sacs and a spider on the furniture on which she was sitting. Unfortunately, the camera decided it was going to focus on the other chair in the background, so all the stuff in the foreground is a little bit fuzzy. But we certainly see this kind of brownish globular spider and the spiky egg sac, so we know it's not a black widow spider. This is the brown widow spider. And if we get a closer look at her posterior thigh, you can, if you squint, make out a target lesion, which has some central erythema surrounded by a ring of pallor, and then maybe this other ring around it with a surrounding purplish color that might be due to some venous congestion, and then there's a freckle right there. Looking even closer, again, we see the erythema with a surrounding area that looks like it's a little bit more pale than that. 
And if we go to extreme close-up, I think I can actually see the fang marks about a millimeter to a millimeter and a half apart. Anyway, this patient did fine with some oral acetaminophen, and I sent her home. Now, if you know anything about recluse spiders, you've heard that they can cause these necrotic skin lesions. And we see in these pictures right here the course over several weeks of somebody who had developed cutaneous loxosalism from a recluse spider bite. And while this can happen, this is at least a moderately severe case. Most bites result in no necrotic lesions at all. Very rarely after a recluse spider bite, but more commonly in kids than adults, patients can develop systemic loxosalism characterized by a rash, joint pain, fever, and hemolysis, and sometimes even renal failure. That being said, most cases are totally benign. Even if they develop a little necrotic skin lesion, all they need is local wound care and it will get better. Although the healing can take a few weeks in cases. But I wanna talk now about the recluse spider, Loxosceles reclusa, and the myth of the California brown recluse spider bite. It's not that brown recluse spiders are a myth. They are real. They are commonly found in the south central U.S. as shown in the shaded region on the map on the right. But we're not in that shaded region. And I'll go so far as to say that brown recluse spider bites do not occur in California. It's an epidemiologic impossibility. In the entire history of people looking at this, only eight specimens of a brown recluse spider have ever been recovered in California. And each time, it was in close association with a shipment from an area where these spiders are endemic, so it just kind of hitched a ride in with the imported goods. And even if each rare imported spider went on a biting rampage, they could not account for the hundreds or thousands of cases of conditions that are blamed on brown recluse spider bites. So here's a slightly more detailed map showing where Loxosceles reclusa lives in the south central United States. And there are some cousin species that even extend as far as eastern California with Loxosceles deserta. So if you study the ecology of these spiders, when you're in an area where they're native, they are found all over the place and they are communal. You don't find just one, you find dozens. And here I'm quoting Dr. Rick Vetter, who is an arachnologist from UC Riverside. He's written a lot about this. If you go to an area where these spiders exist, each house that has some contains more recluse spiders than have ever been found in California. There's this wonderful study that he published about an infestation of over 2,000 brown recluse spiders in a home in Kansas where over a six year period, the four family members there, although they were living right alongside all of these spiders, there were no bites. And yet people will claim that we just get a rare migrant spider here in California, so obviously that's causing all of these cases. It just doesn't make sense. And in the endemic areas, they rarely bite and people don't think it's a big deal. In fact, Vetter did this other study where he asked children, go out and collect some spiders for me. And each of these kids was able to collect an average of over one brown recluse spider per minute. So it would take the average kid in that group eight minutes to collect more brown recluses than the entire California populace has over 40 years. Here's another study from Vetter where he mapped out 216 alleged diagnoses of brown recluse spider bites in California, Oregon, and Washington which is weird because only 17 confirmed Loxosceles reclusa specimens have ever been historically verified in those states. Dr. Vetter also had this Los Angeles area spider survey where he would identify any spider that somebody sent to him. 2,500 spiders were submitted from California. None of them were Loxosceles species. So then why is it if you ask clinicians in the area, that they've seen so many patients with brown recluse spider bites, or I should say alleged brown recluse spider bites. I think it's a combination of a few factors. Number one is arachnophobia. Nearly everyone hates or fears spiders. And there's also the fact that I think a lot of people are unable to accept an endogenous cause for an otherwise unexplained skin lesion. It's a lot easier to blame something from outside your body than maybe some sort of weakness that you may have. And then compounding this is the fact that when somebody has this otherwise unexplained skin lesion and they see a doctor, 
The doctors, unable to generate an adequate differential diagnosis, a list of the potential things it could be, and because brown recluse spiders are a well-known cause of necrotic skin lesions, therefore that must be the cause. And then it just gets repeated. Now, I've collected a lot of case series and case reports of conditions that have been misdiagnosed as brown recluse spider bites. There's a whole bunch of different bacterial infections, viral infections, fungal infections, various vasculitides, a whole range of other primary dermatologic conditions. What about bites from other animals who actually have a good reason to bite a human so that they could get a blood meal? And then among the miscellaneous causes, some of them are ridiculous, including a chemical burn where the patient conveniently forgot that they had used an oven cleaner and it got on their body and caused their skin lesion and then went around claiming it was due to a spider. Now, that being said, you will occasionally encounter a person who says, but there are Loxosceles spiders in California, which is certainly true. Loxosceles deserta, which is one of the cousins of Loxosceles reclusa, which is the recluse spider, so this is just a close cousin, is found in California in the sparsely populated southeastern desert. So there's not many people out there, and in fact, this particular species has a venom which is less toxic than Loxosceles reclusa, which is already not a major medical problem in the areas where this spider is normally found. And then there's actually a small area in Southern California, in Sierra Madre, Alhambra, or Pasadena, where there are some Loxosceles lata, an imported South American species, that actually escaped from somebody's lab. That being said, nobody who wasn't an entomologist looking to find these spiders has ever recovered one of these. There have been no verified bites, and they're only found in some basement steam tunnels and sewers. And if you take a look at part of the map that Vetter had published before, where all of the big black dots represent a supposed diagnosis of brown recluse spider bite, we see that it matches up with the population density of humans much more than anything else. And I think this supports my theory that people who just have unexplained skin lesions believe that they were bitten by a brown recluse spider and or be diagnosed by a physician as having been bitten by a brown recluse spider when, in fact, it is an epidemiologic impossibility. Well, then what is going on with these people who have these alleged spider bites? A lot of the time it's due to a bacterial skin and soft tissue infection and quite often from community-acquired methicillin-resistant Staph aureus, or MRSA. Here's an example case that appeared in Annals of Emergency Medicine. We see that there's this lesion on the arm. There's some intradermal edema in the area. The skin looks a little bit tight because it's filled with fluid. And then right in the center, the skin has started to necrose, to turn dark. And you may be able to imagine that there's some pus stuck under the skin in that area. This was a patient who came to the emergency department saying they had a spider bite. Turned out it was community-acquired MRSA. I sometimes even get people who found that I had written something about spider bites who send me their pictures. These are photographs a woman took of her alleged spider bite on her shin. To me, it looks just like community-acquired MRSA. And in fact, that's what she was treated for. She just wanted a second opinion. All right, changing gears again. Now we're going to talk about scorpions. So the stings from the great majority of scorpion species will cause limited local effects only. It's basically like a bee sting or a wasp sting. There'll be some local pain and swelling and symptomatic care, which might involve some over-the-counter drugs, is all that is necessary. There are, however, a few dozen species found in the world that can cause a severe autonomic storm. And where are these dangerous species? They can be found in Mexico, South America, across North Africa and the Middle East, and extending over into India. Within the United States, there's only one species that has the potential for serious, which is to say potentially fatal envenomation, and that is found almost exclusively in Arizona and a couple of very close nearby areas. Scorpion venom, like a lot of venoms, is a complex mixture. The scorpion venom has this whole range of various transmitters and enzymes, and these are responsible for some local effects with pain and swelling. Scorpion venom also contains neurotoxins, small proteins that will cause the uncontrolled release of neurotransmitters, leading to autonomic hyperactivity and neuromuscular hyperactivity. And the combination of these will cause systemic envenomation. 
So as part of this autonomic storm, as a general rule, you'll see earlier parasympathetic effects, where the patients might salivate, have increased tearing, sweating, and priapism, as shown here with this young boy. And as part of the autonomic storm, in addition to the parasympathetic effects, you can get sympathetic effects as well. These might be concurrent, or they might occur later. And you can get such extreme sympathetic effects that you can get a hypertensive crisis, resulting in heart failure, pulmonary edema, myocarditis, sometimes intracranial hemorrhage. These very severe sympathetic effects are not seen with the dangerous scorpions in the United States. One of the prominent scorpion researchers in the world is Dr. Bawaskar from India, and he is a strong proponent of treating these patients who are typically in rural, resource-poor areas with oral praesesin, the sympathetic blocker, to block the sympathetic effects of this hypertensive crisis. And in addition to the autonomic storm, you can see some prominent neuromuscular effects with uncontrolled movements, writhing and twitching, roving eye movements and fasciculations of the tongue and the airway. And when you combine that with the parasympathetic effects of hypersalivation, that can make airway control a significant danger and a significant issue. And so if you see a person, perhaps a young child, who is now kind of salivating and not controlling their secretions, you might mistake it for them choking on food. I've seen a patient just like that. And there's another weird presentation that has been reported in Arizona where there's a big meth problem. People might have meth around their house and the kid gets into meth and now the kid is all agitated and twitchy and they ask what happened. And rather than tell the doctors and nurses that they're concerned their kid got into meth, they want to come up with a more benign explanation and they'll say, oh, my kid was stung by a scorpion. Scorpions aren't a big deal in Southern California. However, I have seen more than one patient in the emergency department at UC Irvine. Here's a photo that I took of a scorpion that was recovered by a 63-year-old woman who was stung to the tip of her finger. And compared to the quarter, you can see how small this thing was. She was complaining of pain and paresthesias from her finger radiating up the arm to the elbow. She was treated with a digital nerve block using 1% lidocaine and was fine to go home. The potentially dangerous species that's found in the United States is this one, the Arizona bark scorpion, Centroroides sculpturatus. We can tell it's from Arizona because it's next to an Arizona quarter. And now we're coming to one of my pet peeves that I have about scorpions, which is their common association with pancreatitis. If you're studying medicine in medical school, you're probably going to have some mnemonic device to go over the differential diagnosis of pancreatitis and it will include scorpion stings. Well, where the heck did this come from? It actually came from this report from 1970 in the British Medical Journal, where they noticed that a lot of patients who were stung by scorpions in Trinidad developed pancreatitis, 24 out of 30 cases. And these cases were associated with this scorpion right here, Titius trinitatus, which is found in Trinidad. Now, systemic envenomation from several scorpion species around the world can be associated with an elevated serum lipase and amylase, and therefore meeting the criteria for pancreatitis. But clinically evident pancreatitis is uncommon and is virtually non-existent in the United States. So don't be calling up a pancreatitis mnemonic with scorpion stings around me, please. And another thing that really bugs me about scorpions is that they sting. They don't bite and you will find references all throughout the literature and the lay press talking about a scorpion bite. Scorpions don't bite you, the venom comes out of the stinger, and it doesn't come out of the mouth. A scorpion bite, if they could even bite you and you could feel it, is completely inconsequential. So to summarize scorpions, the vast majority of scorpion stings are treated symptomatically. There is one species, the Arizona bark scorpion, which is the only medically important species found in the United States, and it's found almost exclusively in Arizona. There is an antivenom that exists for it called Anascorp. It is available in a limited geographic area because that's only where it's needed. It works very, very well, but it can be quite expensive. And that's the end of this brief video discussion of envenomation. I'll be seeing you around.